And just for the sake of the stream, um, for the recording here, I'm wearing a mask because I had a COVID exposure, but I've tested negative and so on. So please don't be confused or concerned. I'm feeling fine. This is just a precaution in accordance with the CDC advice. So faith, we're gonna finish up faith today. We have four things to cover. Faith is the illumination of reason. Faith is wisdom. Faith in history, not as in history is something which you have faith in, that would be very not smart. Uh, but faith realized historically, faith lived out historically, faith as obedience, as Bart puts it, and then what I'm calling glory in public. So to begin with illumination, we covered last time that faith is not something which we reach by reason. It is not that we take a look at Thomas Aquinas's proofs for the existence of God, and we think for a really long time about those proofs, and eventually we become convinced that there is something like a higher power or a prime mover, a kind of superpower which created the entire world. And then we come to a further conclusion that, oh, the Bible seems to say some interesting stuff about this prime mover. This prime mover must be a trinity. And um, like one of my teachers, Lynn Tonstead at Yale Divinity School, I always abbreviate Trinity with three to the power of three. It's not literally three to the power of three, right? But this is just, this means Trinity whenever I'm, um, whenever I'm making notes. Um, so it's, it's not as though you reason your way to a prime mover and then you take another step and you reason your way to thinking this prime mover is a Trinity and then, you know, and so on and so forth. And you keep reasoning your way into Christian faith. Rather, once you were lost, And now you're found. And this movement works in the complete opposite direction of this. Uh, this marker's not working. The faith by reason. Picture. So here you're starting from the ground and you're moving up, right? We're working our way up intellectually into belief in God. For Bart, the arrow is always down from God to us. God meets us in Jesus Christ. I always abbreviate Christ with an X uh, rather than with a C because my initials are JC and it seems to be a little uh, hubristic to be writing <laughs> JC for Jesus all over my books, <laughs> all over the board. So Jesus is always JX. We do not have the same initials. Uh, oh, but anyway, so you had this kind of exclamation point oh my gosh, I have been met by the living Lord. Now I have this thing called faith. Faith just is being awake to the fact that one has been met in Jesus Christ. It is as um, we ended class last time, Bart says in the church dogmatics, um, it is waking up to discover that you are in your father's house and on your mother's knee. It is to realize that God exists and has promised you, I am there for you, and I will be there for you. This awakening to faith doesn't take place by reason, okay? It's not like you sit down, you read mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis, and then over time, you're convinced. That's not how it worked for C.S. Lewis either. C.S. Lewis went for a walk, and he said at the beginning of the walk, he was an atheist, and by the end of the walk, he believed in God, okay? So you just awake to it, and... This being awake, although it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not reached by reason, it illuminates your reason. So it's not that faith is completely irrational. Coming to faith is not something which takes place by reason. You don't convince yourself of it. But faith is not, um, faith is not believing a thousand impossible things before breakfast. Faith has a kind of logic to it, once you are awake to it. 
Um, this is, um, so I'll illustrate this with a story. When I was a first year divinity school student, I walked into um, the office of one of the three professors who eventually became my dissertation advisors, uh, Catherine Tanner. And I, I was a first year student. I didn't know anything. And um, God bless Professor Tanner. She had a lot of patience with me. I walked in and I said, so Professor Tanner, I'm trying to figure out what it means to make a theological argument. It seems to me that you just cite a whole bunch of theologians and repeat a bunch of things that other people said. And that is what makes a theological argument. And she was very, very gentle and patient with me. And she basically said, well, that's a good way to get started, but that's not quite it. Um, I was very confused though. If, I mean, if you cannot um, investigate God using you know, the techniques of the scientific method, if God is not empirically available in that way, how in the world do you figure out what are valid theological claims and what are not? How can you differentiate between like belief in the Trinity and I don't know uh, what we might know, what we might understand to be superstitions, um, you know, like knocking on wood, which, which I do all the time, but I'm like knocking on wood. I think it's more a habit or something like that. Uh, you know, it doesn't have the same status in my mind as like the witness of the creeds, belief in Jesus Christ. I knock on wood to avert disaster, but am I really counting on that? Am I going to begin my life to the fact that I'm knocking on wood? No. What differentiates the Trinity from knocking on wood? That's what I was trying to figure out. Bart would answer that actually there is a kind of empirical evidence that we are investigating. It's not exactly empirical evidence like, I don't know, a biologist sits down with a really high powered microscope and looks at a cell. What we have though, is we have this man, Jesus Christ, in whom God came in the flesh. And this Jesus lived a human life, lived, spoke, did stuff, died, rose again, ascended, said he's coming back, etc. We actually have empirical data. We have a history of God. And we know this history of God through the Bible. And because God uses the words of the Bible to continue to reveal God's self to us to show us Jesus, to help us to meet Jesus. <coughs> and that means we actually do have something to which our Christian beliefs are logically responsible. <laughs> I thought when I was a first year divinity school student that there was, that really you could say anything about God. You can just say anything about God. And I used to, um, actually, I wrote an undergraduate thesis where I said, you can basically say anything about God so long as it ended up making people morally better instead of morally worse. Because I, 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 anyway, I no longer believe that. There are true things that you can say about God and there are false things you can say about God. There are lots of false things about God on TikTok, okay? This totally <laughs> drives me up the wall because uh, my eighth grade confirmation students are on TikTok and they bring me these TikTok videos. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it's just chock full of lies, right? And why are they lies? Because they contradict who Jesus Christ revealed God to be as I have met and known this Jesus Christ in the reading of the scriptures. That's why I know these TikTok videos are um, full of baloney. So Bart says something much like that with far fewer words on page 22. In the word which the church has to proclaim, the truth is involved, not in a provisional secondary sense, but in the primary sense of the word itself. The logos is involved. You guys recall that in the prologue to the gospel, John in John chapter one, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God, and so on. The word there, the English word, word with a capital W, is the Greek word logos. This was a um, thought 
the Logos was thought by Greek philosophers to be the divine principle of reason, which permeated the entire cosmos. And the intervention of the Gospel of John is to say that this Logos, this divine principle of reason about which the Stoics and others have been writing for years and years and years, was made incarnate in Jesus. And that this Logos had a particular relationship to something that this incarnate Logos called Father, as well as a relationship to a something which this incarnate Logos referred to as the Spirit. So from this history, right, from this, from this history of God made flesh, the Logos made flesh, we get our belief in the Trinity, for example. That's why we believe in the Trinity with a stronger kind of belief, please excuse my phone, than when I'm knocking on wood. If Jesus is the Logos, if Jesus is the divine principle of reason, then faith can't be irrational or anti rational faith has to have a kind of logic to it faith is not reached by reason not this picture but faith once we have it once god has met us once the logos has been made flesh and once the news of that has reached us personally once christ has been revealed to us personally in the reading of the scriptures for bart then our human reason And think God, etc., and can think God, etc., using the same ordinary rules of reason by which we know that one plus one equals two, uh, by which we know that if um, that the statement um, red is a color, but not all colors are red, is a valid statement, right? They're just kind of elementary rules of logic and reason uh, which we use to access and make sense of the world we can apply those things to the one whom we have literally met in god's act of self-revelation so on page 24 in the first full paragraph, we started from the point that Christian faith is a meeting. Christian faith and knowledge of Christian faith takes place at the point where the divine reason, the divine logos, sets up his law in the region of man's understanding, to which law human creaturely reason must accommodate itself. So that last sentence is very, is very important because Bart goes on on this page to say that two things are true of this, of our reasoning about this God whom we have met in faith. The first is that we are limited, that is, we are finite, which means that as finite rather than infinite, our concepts are not adequate to grasp this treasure is what he says in the second full paragraph on page 24. The second is that we are sinful. We are both finite and sinful. And that means that our reasoning about God is never going to be complete, nor is it going to be perfect. But it doesn't mean that faith, the Christian faith doesn't have any reasonableness to it. It doesn't mean that the statement God is a turnip has the same kind of truth value as the statement God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Does this make any sense, this talking about reason? Does anybody have a question about it? I want to pause here to, um, to ask your questions. Does it make sense to you that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has a different kind of truth to it than the statement God is eternal? And the way that Bart would explain why God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is true, and God is eternal, is just um, babbling about God. I think he says um, on the bottom of 22, Christian proclamation theology is no talk 
or babbling. It is not propaganda unable to withstand, withstand the claim. Is it then true as well? This that is said, is it really so? Yes, Gary. Well, isn't a precondition to God being the Trinity as opposed to a turnip? Uh, the predicate is that you're illuminated. Yes. If you're not illuminated, there's really not a lot of difference. That's exactly right. Yes, that's totally right. If somebody has not made this existential <coughs> leap into faith, if one has not, um, if one has not been, is, is let, I mean, a leap makes it seem like faith is the decision, like we have a chasm in front of us and faith is just the decision to jump. It's more that God is like reached over the chasm, grasps us, and then drug us over the chasm, right? But if one has not been brought over the chasm, then God is a turnip and God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're both nonsense. That's exactly right. Once you have been illuminated, once you have faith, once you've been met by Jesus Christ, then those two are those two statements are two entirely different kinds of statements. I think this is important because it means that you can talk back to preachers, right? I mean, we're 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 just human beings. We're just human beings. We make mistakes. And sometimes preachers, sometimes myself included, we say things that are wrong about God, right? Not everything somebody says about God is true. And there is a way that you can evaluate these claims. You can test them against the revelation of God and Jesus. If it looks like Jesus, if it smells like Jesus, it's true. If it doesn't look like Jesus, it doesn't smell like Jesus, it's false. Bart has that kind of clarity. So I wanted to draw your attention briefly. That's enough about faith as illumination. Uh, but I wanted to draw your attention briefly to the passage on page 23 where Bart illuminates better, I think, than he did in the previous chapter, what I was saying about if you can think God, God, this God that you would imagine would end up just being a monster. Uh, it's this picture. This is why the arrow, but they can't go up. It has to go down. can't go up from us to God. It has to go down from God to us. It's the first full paragraph on 23. Um, Bart says, of course, it is of the nature and being of this object, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that he cannot be known by the powers of human knowledge, but is apprehensible and apprehended solely because of his own freedom, decision, and action. All that sentence means is that we can't figure out, we can't deduce God this way by working from like Thomas Aquinas' proofs and then eventually we convince ourselves God exists. Rather, God has to meet us. God has to come this way. That's what he means by God is apprehensible and apprehended solely because of his own freedom, his own decision and action that is to become incarnate in Jesus. Um, he goes on to say, what man can know by his own power, according to the measure of his natural powers, his understanding, his feeling, will be at most something like a supreme being, an absolute nature, an <coughs> idea of an utterly free power of a being towering over everything. This absolute and supreme being, the ultimate and most profound, this thing in itself has nothing to do with God. It is part of the intuitions and the marginal possibilities of man's thinking, man's contrivance. Man is able to think this being, but he is not thereby thought of God. So this is actually, this is what, this is part of what Jewel is um, presenting at AAR. Um, this natural knowledge of God is sometimes thought of into mystic thought in the thought of thomas aquinas and his successors it's often known as the natural knowledge of god this knowledge of god simply by human reason this idea of a higher power who is in charge um bar thinks it's very important that this is not god because if all you have is the idea of a higher power and you look at the universe this god is basically a serial killer if you believe in the higher power who's in control of everything is responsible for everything how do you know this God loves you? I should look at the world. I don't see. <laughs> the world's got a lot of great stuff in it, but it also includes mosquitoes. And that's before we get into um, get into all of the data with which Bart is grappling, right? The, the world that this higher power is supposedly in charge of is not just the world of mosquito. It's a world of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. So Bart doesn't find the idea of the higher power comforting at all because this higher power could very well just turn out to be a serial killer. The fact that God has revealed himself in Jesus shows that this God is a God of love. 
The promise of Christianity is not to believe that there's a higher power that's in charge of everything, but rather that God exists and that this God has promised us, I am there for you, as Barb said in the previous chapter. That's good news. The idea that there's a higher power, not that good. Not good news. Not for Barb. Okay, so that's on page 23. Uh, moving on to faith is wisdom. This illumination of our reason, this um, the fact that faith makes a kind of sense, it has truth claims, there are things that you can say are true, things that you can say are false, etc. You don't have to believe in crystals the way that you believe in the Trinity. You don't have to believe in knocking on wood in the way you believe in the Trinity, um, etc., etc. This faith is ultimately not intellectual, it's practical. So he says on page... 25, this light, if you use the metaphor of illumination, right, this light is not a light to wonder at or to observe, not a light to kindle all manner of fireworks at, not even the profoundest philosophical speculations, but the light on our road, which we may stand above our action and above our talk, the light on our healthy and on our sick days, in our poverty and in our wealth, the light which does not only lighten when we suppose ourselves to have moments of insight, but which accompanies us even into our folly, which is not quenched when all is quenched, when the goal of our life becomes visible in death. To live by this light, by this truth, is the meaning of Christian knowledge. Christian knowledge means living in the truth of Jesus Christ. So this light which illuminates this light of faith which illuminates our life is a light on our road. It is knowledge that God is there for us in all of these circumstances. It is not meant simply to be knowledge in your head. Um, he says in the next chapter on page 32, that's why I marked it there, that if our faith is real, it must encroach upon our life. Um, so, to review faith, faith, by this point, we know Bart has said nine to the idea that you can think your way to faith. He has said, rather, that faith is a meeting. It's a meeting in which you wake up and realize that you are in your father's house and on your mother's knee, and it is a faith that because of the knowledge of that love, the love that the, uh, that the God of the universe has been has decided freely to become incarnate in Jesus so that this God would be there for you, to be not God in the abstract, but to be God for you, that this knowledge means that you can walk through any life circumstance and be okay. You can trust this God's promises. You can trust that you are going to be okay. In addition, this faith is going to give you certain uh, roadmap is not quite right. Um, but this faith is something which makes it possible for you to be obedient to this God. Yes. Okay, so it makes you know that anything can happen and you will be okay. In what time frame? Because again, with the Holocaust, those absolutely. people absolutely believed in God and you hear wonderful stories. And yet at the end of the day, they were murdered. And yeah. um, so. Not necessarily in this life. So there is this, um, uh, we're going to get to what theologically is known as eschatology. Eschatology comes from eschaton which means end, logi from logos, right? Reasoning about or study of. So it's the study of the end, eschatology. Uh, Bart has an eschatology. He's always going to say that um, you're okay, both because God has somehow already fixed everything, and eventually, the way that God has fixed everything is going to seep into every nook and cranny of the world, and you're really, really, really going to be okay. Um, Isn't that where our faith would come from, too? Yes. That's why we have to try to have faith. So this is why in the first chapter 
on faith in chapter two, on the top of page 20, or it says that the believer in God's word may hold on to this word and everything in spite of all that contradicts it, including the Holocaust, etc. It is so we never believe on account of, never because of. We awake to faith in spite of everything. In spite of the fact that the world looks like it was set up by a serial killer, we awake to the idea that we are actually in our father's house and not our mother's name. And we awake to this because of what happens in Christ. Uh, that this God freely chooses to be with us and freely chooses to suffer the worst fate of all. Um, the cross for Bart, as we will see, is not just Jesus suffering an untimely death, a particularly gruesome death. It is Jesus suffering <laughs> the catastrophe of all good, the defeat of all good by absolute radical evil. Uh, this is what's going on behind the scenes, according to Bart in the crucifixion. Uh, but we'll, we'll get to that later. Bart thinks that this crucifixion and resurrection of Christ has already won the victory, but it is not yet fully manifest. And so you're always going back and forth between it's already done, but it's not yet complete or not yet revealed, etc. So that means that when you, you know, if you are, um, if you are Maximilian Colby and you are a, um, uh, you know, you're, you're struggling to have Christian faith in a concentration camp, you're not necessarily going to expect God to snap God's fingers and bring you, you know, magically teleport you out of the concentration camp. You're going to know that somehow already Christ has made even this okay. And that in the long run, the longest run, as it were, I'm going to be okay too. And all will be made. Okay. Does that make some sense? Yeah, I mean, there's a sign up by the Lutheran Church. Have you seen it? They, yeah. They say, say what's on it. Uh, it said, believe or believe and wait for what is unseen, something along yes. those lines. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, and because we're talking about the, um, because we're talking about uh, concentration camps, um, this faith and this redemption that God is accomplishing in Christ is not something which for Bart is enjoyed only by people who are explicitly Christians, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we discussed this, yes, we discussed this last time that it's possible for Bart that God can reveal God's self through anything. God could famously, Bart says, God could reveal God's self through a dead dog. God could speak through a dead dog if God wanted to. God just so happens to use the words of scripture to do so, uh, to reveal Jesus to us. But God, God could use anything, presumably other religions, in order, to in order to reveal Jesus to us. Judaism, though, is a particular case. It's not just that God is... It, it, Judaism is different than, like, than Buddhism, for example. God could, for Bart, speak through Buddhism, uh, reveal Jesus through Buddhism, but... The Jewish tradition has a, has a different status than Buddhism because the Jewish the, the Jewish religion is established on the covenant between the people of Israel and the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob is the exact same God about whom Christians purport to speak all of the time. It's the same God. Uh, it's um, and in fact, Jesus' story grows out of the history of the people of Israel. So for Bart, the people of Israel are always good, right? Just because. We have a covenant through Jesus just because Jesus is the one through whom God works this redemption, etc. Doesn't mean that Christianity somehow replaces Judaism. Judaism is all good for Bart because they have the original covenant. The fact that we now have a new covenant through which Gentiles and non-Jews can enter, that's, um, that doesn't invalidate in any way the original covenant between God and Israel. Um, Something that I, I feel I needed to say, uh, given the, the more people uh, died in the Holocaust than just Jews, but Jews, uh, you know, astronomically, um, the majority of the people who died in the Holocaust. Um, and a part of the, uh, part of the horrific racial ideology of Nazi Germany, um, anti-Semitism. So, um, 
moving on here from life for our path to faith in history. What are we supposed to do about all of this stuff? Is faith just a matter of believing something? And can we believe this in private? Bart says, no, we cannot believe in private. Um, God has a history, and it is through this history that we know God. Um, God is not just an idea. God is a person, as it were. God has, at the very least, become a person in Jesus. So he says at the beginning of chapter 4 on page 28, Christian faith is faith in God. And when the Christian confession names God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, he is pointing to the fact that in his inner life and nature, God is not dead, not passive, not inactive, but that God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit existed in an inner relationship and movement, which may very, excuse me, which may very well be described as a story as an event. This is language which Bart is particularly fond of to call God an event. Um, the thing about God being a trinity for Bart rather than an abstract being or an abstract essence is that this God is somehow in an active, dynamic, living relationship with God's self in God's self, though almost what it means to be God is to be this active dynamic relationship between these three things, what Bart calls modes of being, of which we call Father, Son, and Spirit. So God is an event, and this event of God enters into human history in Jesus. And so he says, God himself is not supra historical, but historical. And this God has in himself made a decree, an eternal decree, upon which everything rests of which the confession of faith speaks. Our fathers called it the decree of creation and of covenant and of redemption. This decree of God was carried out in time once for all in the work and in the word of Jesus Christ. So here, I'm just going to flag it. We're going to talk about it a lot in a couple of weeks. This is Bart's doctrine of election. So this is the act by which God enters into human history, by which God meets us in Jesus, and so on. This is God's free, free himself, but to be God for us. I'm hoping that I did not completely lose. Can you guys still hear on the stream? Yes, we can hear you. No. Just can't, can't see, see you. you. <clears throat> There we go. Can Marcia, can you give me a thumbs up? Are You're you... back. Thank you. Perfect. Sorry about that. I nudged a wire. I can't nudge any wires. <laughs> um, okay. So this is his doctrine of election. We're gonna get to we're gonna get to this in length later on. Uh, this is the particular twist um, that Bart gives to the Calvinist idea of predestination. Um, so you may, if you're familiar with, um, with Calvinism, with certain kinds of Presbyterianism, which is the tradition that Bart is coming from, you may be familiar with the language of predestination, groups of, you know, you've got the elect, those who are predestined for heaven, for life, and the reprobate, those who are predestined for hell, etc. Bart, his twist is going to say, predestination is not about us, it's about God. And what happens is that God predestines Jesus. Uh, this is God's election. Um, in any case, that's just a teaser. There's going to be a lot more to come about that. Jesus is the one who is predestined, perhaps both to be the elect and the reprobate. But we'll, uh, we'll get to that in a few weeks. So you've got God who is in God's self as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. A history of a kind, an event, a relationship, an active living relationship. You have this God making an actual decree, an election to elect to be a particular kind of God, to be God for us, not God without us. And if this faith has to do, he says, with the God who is in himself historical and has fashioned a decree, whose goal is in history and has set this history going and completed it, 
then Christian faith, which was not itself history, would not be Christian faith. Christian faith is something which is lived out in history. It has a historical form. That sounds abstract. All that it means is that it's supposed to change your life. It's supposed to actually change your life. And it's supposed to actually change every part of your life. If this faith is light for your road, you're going to walk differently than you did before you were awake to the fact that God is with you in Jesus. This is the reason why Bart said on page 32, which I referred to before, that if our faith is real, it must encroach upon our life. Um, he goes on, Bart does, to say that there are two basic kinds of testimony that we give to faith, two different kinds of confession. And here I'm getting to glory in public. This confession also seems to be a form of obedience. It's as though you awake to trust in this God, and then you are moved by this trust to act in certain ways and to say certain things. There's a kind of confession which you give within the church. He calls this the language of Canaan. This is the language of the creeds, right? This is the language of Christian belief. This is the kind of stuff that we're doing right now. Then there is also a translation of the language of Canaan, the language of the church, into the language of the newspaper, which is on page 33. The language of the newspaper is there at the, there at the top after the italicized word translation. On, um, on page 32, he says, uh, Bart says that where confession is serious and clear, it must be fundamentally translatable into the speech of Mr. Everyman, the man and woman in the street, into the language of those who are not accustomed to reading scripture and singing hymns, but who possess a different vocabulary and quite different spheres of interest. Then he goes on to say that all Christians actually are, have these other spheres of interests. We are whole people, not just part people. Not one of us is only a Christian. We are also all a bit of the world, he says. So if you go back to the top of page 28, to this little italicized outline at the top, you'll recall this is what Bart was lecturing from. So he had these italicized portions uh, with him, and then he began to basically riff and improvise on them. He did not have a written manuscript. You'll see... The Christian faith is the decision in which men have the freedom to be publicly responsible for their trust in God's word and for their knowledge of the truth of Jesus Christ. So that's chapter two and chapter three. Uh, chapter two on distrust, on awake, waking up, to be in your father's house and on your mother's knee. And then two, for their knowledge of the truth of Jesus Christ. That's the fact that their reason, practical reason, and reason otherwise has been illuminated. Um, they know that. What comports with Jesus is true, and what doesn't comport with Jesus is false when speaking of God. Um, so it's the freedom to be publicly responsible for this trust and this knowledge in both the language of the church, but also in worldly attitudes and in corresponding actions and conduct. So he gives an example, and the example on page 33 is very powerful. About halfway down the page, this is an example of the absence of a worldly attitude and the absence of corresponding actions and conduct. Let us beware of remaining stuck where we are and refusing to advance to meet worldly attitudes. For instance, in 1933 in Germany, there was plenty of serious, profound, and living Christianity and confession. God be praised and thanked. But unfortunately, this faith and confession of the German church remained <coughs> embedded in the language of the church. And did not translate into, excuse me, and did not translate what was being excellently said in the language of the church into the political attitude demanded at the time, in which it would have become clear that the evangelical church had to say no to national socialism, no from its very roots. The confession of Christianity did not at the time become clear in this form. And he goes on to say, I hope that a space for the church is not set up again and fortified and that Christians gather among themselves. Theology, of course, must be pursued with all seriousness, but we may, but may we be confronted, and better than 12 years ago, 
with the fact that what was to happen in the church must go out into the form of worldly attitudes. An evangelical church, which was today, say, prepared to keep silence on the issue of guilt with regard to the events from which we have issued, which was unwilling to listen to this question, which must be answered honestly for the sake of the future, would a priori condemn itself to unfruitfulness. So I said that um, in the first lecture that a lot of Bart's, um, one of the work that Bart is about in this post-war period is trying to um, encourage German politicians, the German people, to acknowledge their guilt and complicity in the evils of the Holocaust and World War II in general, uh, the evils of national socialism writ large. Um, and he's saying that what happened, one way of describing what happened to the Christian church in Germany <coughs> during the time of Hitler's rise to power was that they cloistered in their churches and they talked a lot in the language of the church and they didn't translate it into the corresponding worldly attitudes and actions of the language of the newspaper. That is, they didn't say no to national socialism when they should have said no to national socialism. <laughs> Saying no to national socialism is not a theological for Bart. It follows from the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ couldn't be a Nazi, you have to say no to national socialism. That's it. It's a religious statement, actually, to say no to Nazism for Bart. It follows from the witness, from the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. And Hello. I'm just going to mute Molly. Um, it's interesting. Uh, that the, um, the evangelical church of Germany didn't do that act of translation. You'll remember from my first lecture that Bart attempted himself to do that act of translation through the Barman Declaration, uh, which was the founding document of the confessing church, the underground Christian church in Germany, with which Dietrich Bonhoeffer was associated. <coughs> so uh, this confession has worldly political attitudes included in it. Um, but this confession is a, it is an outflowing of God's glory, which has been revealed to you in faith into the world through you. Um, so you should hear this not as Bart saying God is trying to give you more things to do, so much as in faith you are really met by God. You are illuminated because guess what? God is bright. <laughs> God is bright. God is illuminating. God is alluring. God is beautiful. God is glorious. And so this is on page 30. Doxa, the Greek word for glory in the New Testament. Gloria, of course, the Latin word for glory. Uh, God is in God's self beautiful, glorious. And when this glory meets you, you wake up to it. It's like being in awe of something. And this glory shines out from you when you have faith. It transfigures you like Jesus was transfigured on the mountaintop. So he says on the top of page 30, or uh, about halfway through the paragraph at the top of page 30, the word and work of the believer cannot possibly remain a neutral, uncommitted work and word where there is faith, God's doxa, gloria, his brightness is necessarily made known on earth, and where God's glory did not shine one way or other, however overcast and broken by our ways in our degeneration, there would be no faith. The comfort and the light we receive from God would not be accepted. Where there is faith, man in his complete limitation and helplessness, in his utter abandonment and folly, possesses the freedom to let the light shine of the doxa of the gloria of the glory of God. More is not required of us, but that is required of us. So I have um about five minutes here to take questions on what we've discussed for today. And then I have an illustration from Mozart, as usual. Um, any comments or questions? Robin? Could I just make a little non-class um, announcement about the collection for the oh, yes, please. college? Please yeah, speaking of glory in public. I'd like, to, I'd like to push for more contributions, either by check in the plate or 
the lists, which are all around the church. These are students at the college. There have been 800 me, um, visits to the food pantry so far this school year. These are people who have to choose between paying for transportation, paying for their classes and paying for food. So it's really kind of a, a one-up desperate need. And I would thank you if you would bring something and put it in the baskets. And there are, as I said, there are lists um, by Prisca's office and also uh, in the Narthex. Thanks. That's very, that's very helpful, Robin. So this is for Norwalk Community College for their student food bank, not for the new Canaan Food Pantry. The baskets are in the Narthex and by Prisca's office here at the very end of this hallway. Part of what I think might be happening, Robin, is that there's been an, there's been an influx of parish donations to the new Canaan Food Pantry. Right. I think people are confusing the new Canaan Food Pantry, which is wonderful, which is brilliant, which is certainly something that we should do. Right. And people are confusing that food pantry for the collection for the Norwalk Community College Food Pantry. I think so too. Uh, so the, yeah. the generosity just getting anyway, we're gonna we're gonna spread the generosity. <laughs> so uh so, you know, we'll commend the baskets too and not just the food pantry down here. So thank you, Robin. That's one way that um oh uh, yeah, yeah, this glory becomes public and shines out through us through generosity. Um other questions about Bart. Yes, Gary. Um I don't know quite how to phrase this, but does the does the requirement in, of interpreting the word of God through Jesus Christ and making value judgments in the real world fall to the feet of the cleric, mm. or the church, or to the people? As a practical example, by teaching the many substantive issues confronted through the Bible representing the actions of Christ, um, then is that to be summarized by the clergy from the pulpit in taking a political position to a given political party in that an awful lot of people have said, and sometimes I believe that you can justify virtually anything through the word of the Bible. That's a great question. Uh, so, Bart thinks that the ground at the foot of the cross is level. So, the cleric is not any closer to God than anybody in the pew. What the cleric is doing through preaching primarily is bearing witness to their encounter with God in Christ through the scriptures and it's incumbent upon <coughs> every Christian to test that proclamation against this witness of the scriptures to Jesus against the revelation of God in Jesus uh, it's particularly incumbent upon theologians to do that so we talked about um, uh, dogmatics is an attempt to help to sharpen and refine the church's proclamation uh, so part of what Bart thinks his job is, is to make preaching better, <laughs> to, to test it, to see how closely it aligns with Jesus and how closely it doesn't. Um, so I would say the task that you're describing is one which is incumbent upon everybody. Uh, Bart would not think it would be inappropriate to make certain partisan political comments from the pulpit. So far as to say no to national socialism was to say no to a party. It was to take a partisan political position in Germany. Uh, but he would say that that always needs to, that those statements always need to be tested by everybody against the revelation of God in Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in that sense, nothing is off the table, but everything has to be focused on Jesus. I had a preaching professor who said that um, one of the major problems with much preaching is that it conceives of the preacher? Um, here, let me just erase, I'll erase the knowledge of the Trinity there. Uh, it conceives of the triangle of preaching as being um, the preacher, the congregation, and the world. That's not it. The preacher is not above the congregation and the world. Instead, the triangle should be the word by which she meant 
the scriptures and Jesus as revealed by the scriptures. The scriptures so far as they reveal Jesus to us, the preacher and the congregation. The preacher is supposed to be right here with the congregation, bearing witness to the congregation, what it is that they've heard from the word, but the word is sovereign. God is the one who we're supposed to be listening to. Um, anyway, I hope that I hope that's helpful. Um, I want to turn here to Mozart um, to another piece from the um, from the Great Mass in C minor. Let me share my screen, share sound, optimize for video. I didn't optimize for video or share my sound last time, so I'm afraid that the uh, the distortion on the Zoom was um was pretty bad. Sorry about that. Um, this from an essay about Mozart um, by Bart. This is again, this is another, um, it's a piece of religious music, right? It's a setting of the words of the Gloria, uh, which we say at St. Mark's, um, glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Um, this is the part of the Gloria where um, La Damas say, we, we worship you, we glorify you, etc. That's what's being said over and over and over again. Um, Bart writes, Mozart cannot possibly allow the soprano in the C minor mass to sing the same music for the Laudamus Te or the Et Incarnatus Est, as for example, the page in Figaro, where Figaro sings, you know the impulses of the heart and the like. This is so even though he unmistakably gives the same color to both, in both he hears and respects the word in this distinctive forming character, but then to both he sets his own music, a music bound by the word, but in this binding still, a sovereign shape with its own nature. So what he's saying there is it was very popular uh, for musicians, <laughs> composers to take shortcuts by taking tunes, as it were, music from other, uh, other pieces that they had written and repurposing them. Um, Handel's Messiah was infamous, famous for this, depending on your perspective. Uh, and he shall purify is, uh, for example, um, a piece from, uh, from something else that Handel wrote. Um, Oh, we like sheep have gone astray. For unto us a child is born. Of course, Messiah is the way that most of us know this music, but Handel wrote it for other settings. Bart is saying that Mozart never, Mozart couldn't do this because Mozart would take the words of the, the Laudamus Te, this, we glorify you, we praise you, etc., and he would write music particularly for it. Now, it doesn't mean that Mozart didn't then take this church music and put it in another context. He did. He actually wrote an oratorio. Um, or Lent that was based on based on the, um, the the C minor mass, but to begin with, Mozart wrote this music to describe these words. And if this is um, the reason why I like the Laudato Si is because I think it it, um, it embodies the joy of letting the light which has come to you in faith shine throughout the world. If you think of this light which is meeting you, this revelation of God which is meeting you in Jesus Christ as the orchestra, I think of the soprano soloist. As you. The soprano soloist begins to sing in ways that respond, that seem to reflect the same joy, conviviality, and glory of the orchestration. And that's the way that this is, that, that's the way that our public witness, that's the way that our living our faith in history is supposed to be. We just let this light kind of overwhelm us and then shine out from us. <laughs> 